Hello, this is Daniel Raymond, the voice behind Ray's Guide, and this is the third video in a series explaining server meshing from the player's experience. In the first video, I explained client-side object container streaming, server-side object container streaming, and discussed the two main problems with the current system, that is absolute dispersal, which is mostly a server problem, and absolute concentration, which is mostly a client problem. And both are the reason behind the 50-player server cap, the thing that everybody wants to get beyond. In the second video, I discussed shards, their history, what they do, the issues in persistence that they cause, and why we want as few of them as possible while still not be saddling two-thirds of the world with the lag disadvantage from being farther away from the data center. My estimate is that the equilibrium between those two concerns will be three to five shards covering continent-sized regions. But to start with, we may have almost as many shards as we currently have servers. One of the main challenges in getting from having too many shards to just a handful will be getting the necessary performance out of the subject of this video, the replication layer. So the replication layer is one of the biggest innovations of the current model of server meshing, in part because it breaks out from the traditional back-end, front-end application stack of layers. In my video on server meshing from a year ago, I described the game server as being like the game master in a pen and pencil role-playing game, and that it had three main roles. It presents the game world to the players, receives their actions, and adjudicates the results. Now imagine that instead the Game Master doesn't present the game to the world, but instead has handed that big binder of game world information to somebody else, and that that somebody else reads from the big binder of game information and presents the game world to you, and not just to you, but also to the game server who learns about things at the same time as you do. Could that work? Yes, but it seems initially extra complicated. Why would you do that? Well, mostly to allow dynamic server meshing on a small scale. Well, consider that right next to your table on a game server, there is another table with the players in the area right next to your table. See how this is applying to server meshing? And there are some big things that are near the edge and that might need to be seen by both the players at your table and the players at the other table. Let's say a capital ship. So when describing the cap ship, this guy who is reading from the big binder, can shout out so that the players at your table hear it, the people at the other table hear it, and that both of the game masters hear it all at the same time. Of course, they aren't actually speaking loud, they are just building and maintaining a multicast recipient list so that everybody who needs to know about the cap ship can with just one stream. But the result is similar. They send the update once and everybody who needs to gets it. That's efficient although it does add the extra work of maintaining that recipient list on everything in the universe. And unlike the game server, the replication server has to keep that recipient list even if the length of the recipient list is zero. To use an example from a prior video, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does anybody need to know about it? Well, the replication layer needs to know about it so that it can write it in the big binder of information so that when somebody does come to where the tree is, the replication layer can show it down. So, let's return to the example of the pen and pencil game master. If you walk into the room and they describe it and say that there's a book on the table, they don't need to repeat for every single melee round that there is a book on the table. No, they would only mention the book again if something changed. It moved, burst into flames, started making noise, whatever. In the same respect, an Aurora just sitting on the landing pad doesn't need to be updated from the game server every frame. But what if it isn't just sitting there but engaging in a space battle? Let's say the Aurora is being flown by a player, changes directions, fires its weapons, whatever. The signal for its new action has to travel the data center where it is read by the game server. The game server then validates and adjudicates the action, such as whether it collided with something or didn't really have the power to do the maneuver or it had been damaged, whether it actually hit, how much damage it did, whatever. It then passes that information to the replication layer, which then, if necessary, updates the big binder of game world data and then passes the new information to everyone on the recipient list for that Aurora. Now, no way that's going to happen within the time frame of one frame on your monitor. Not because the interaction with the shard components can't happen that fast, but which is why they have to be close together in the same facility, but there is also the lag time to get the information from the Aurora's player to the shard data center and from the data center back down to the other players. That's why there is janky motion. Note that jerky motion is not the same thing as low frame rate. Even though many players think they are the same thing, Low frame rate comes from your client being unable to calculate and shade all the polygons to render the frame fast enough. 
jerky motion comes from not getting frequent enough position information about things that are moving and acting in the setting. So frame rate improvements like Gen 12 and Vulcan will not change jerky motion. Jerky motion is helped by making the various components in the shard very high performance and in limiting the ping, although that may be out of CIG's or even AWS's control. But there are a couple of technologies for hiding janky motion that games often use. They aren't mentioned in the server meshing discussion because simply they're not server technologies. They are client technologies. The first generally goes by the title predictive motion. In other words, if the Aurora was moving at a certain speed and acceleration in the last frame, it will be predicted to move in the same speed and acceleration in this frame. This of course means that when the replication layer does update with actual speed and position, there may be a small jerk, but it will likely be fairly close to the predicted location. The second also goes for different titles, but I call it advisory motion. In other words, when you and the Aurora send your joystick or throttle motion or attack trigger to the server, you also use multicasting to send it to everybody else on your recipient list for the information about you. The difference is that the information coming from you is not regarded as official, but the other systems can use it in an advisory manner to adjust their predictive motion. It's like you're in a battle in a pen and pencil game, and you say, my female elf leggy lass is going to jump on the back of the cave troll and shoot an arrow into the base of the skull, just like in the movies. It happened in the movies, so why can't I? And the others might plan their reaction to that and maybe even move the character on the map board. But they all know that what really is going to happen is being controlled by the dice rolls being made by the game master behind their screen. And might very well look like my dog Scout catching a treat out of the air. But in most cases, you will tell your ship to do, and what server says happens is the same. So the combination of predictive motion and advisory motion can reduce, but not eliminate, the number of jerky motions on the screen. But they aren't perfect. And that is why a server-centric model of an MMO will never offer the equivalent smooth motion of a match-based game like Call of Duty. Because in a match-based game, the server is basically acting as a scorekeeper and observer, and not the official arbiter of what players are doing, which is kept peer-to-peer, -peer, and the advisory actions are the official actions. But why do MMOs take such a server-centric approach, even though it affects jerky motion? One word, persistence. Yeah, that which is the role of the next three big things that make up a shard, what I've been calling in this video the big binder of game information, but which is actually called the Entity Graph Database. But getting into the Entity Graph Database is too much to still include in this video. So let's talk about the Grow the Channel Ship giveaway. As of recording, we are halfway to the subscriber goal and a third of the way to the member goal to release to some lucky player their choice of the Anvil Liberator, that ship shipping ship for shipping your ships, or the Misk Odyssey, the long duration exploration carrier. One entry per video. If you're a member, you're entered automatically. And if the winner is a member, as of the publication of the winning video, then they win both the Liberator and the Odyssey. For non-members, just be a subscriber and comment somehow using the secret word. And the secret word for this video Video is the name of the ship that I use in the example of ship movement. Fly safe, keep it real, and I'll see you in the verse. This is Daniel Raymond for Ray's Guide.